So how do you think these planets are discovered? All right. Um, well, nope. 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 <laughs> We're talking the Kepler mission. It doesn't do wobble. What was your lab? What was your lab? Yeah, no, no. That, that's good. So here, wow, we got colored chalk today. So this is the star. And this is Mercury. Or 37B. And so when the planet moves in front of the star, it blocks off a little light, right? And it's really, really not a lot of light. Um, I, I've, I don't know what this signal was, but it was really small. In the case of, uh, so there's, there's four planets in the system, 37D, 37C, and 37D. <laughs> yeah. And 37D blocked off 600 parts per million of light from the host star. Let's see. Yeah. So that's, that's six tenths of a thousand. Yeah, but it's hard to see. Point to point scatter for Kepler is still about half a percent. So it wouldn't have been enough half a percent. It's really small. Yeah, so what you see, what you measure, is you measure how bright the star is. Kepler is like an owl. It just stares at one set of stars forever. Occasionally it rotates its head <laughs> every, every three or four months. That's it. And so all you get is how bright everything is as a function of time. And so what you're looking for is a signal that looks like this. And this is when the, the thing first starts to cover one limb of the star and it goes down. But in the middle of the star, it's blocking the same amount of light no matter where it is. So you get this nice plateau, and then as it goes out in front of the star, it looks like that. Well, yeah, and so if I were to draw this to scale, I can't draw this to scale. That, that'd be too small to see, but we're talking about something that's more like this. You see what I mean? And this is probably like a percent, or a half a percent. I can't come close to drawing anything that looks like this. Um, and so that's what it does. And so it's, it's easier to find bigger planets. Um, but it turns out, you know, there can be noise in the data. Stars can do bad things. How could a star pretend like a planet is going across it? Yes. Exactly. So imagine, imagine while it has its back turned to you, that it develops a sunspot a star spot, and then that star spot rotates into view, and it's dark, and so you see exactly this. How would having a lot of data... Exactly. You have to see more than one time it go in front of the star. So if we were looking for the Earth, say in a, another civilization was watching the Earth to see if it goes in front of our star, and they see a blip, and they're like, yeah, but it could be a star spot. How long would they have to wait to check it again? A radio signal How long? A year. a year. So you'd have to observe for a year. And isn't the Kepler criterion that you need two, th I mean, two repeats, so three total things, so that you want to see it yet again? So that would take three years. So you can't do this mission in a year. And that's just for our department. And that's just for us. Now, the closer a planet is into its star, the shorter the period is. So if a planet has a 30-day period, it's really easy to get multiple orbits. But say it, yeah, say we were looking for Jupiter, how long would we have to wait? Anybody know? It's a little too long, but in the ballpark. 15's better. <laughs> I, I actually don't know, I think it's 12. 11.9, yeah, so 12 years. So if you needed three orbits, that'd be 36 years. The Kepler satellite's only designed to go like six or seven years, right? Even with the extended mission. So yeah, this is... Depends. Yeah, if, if the small planets are closer, then it kind of depends. It's designed to find Earth-like planets. 
So this was not optimized to find Jupiters. Um, it's to, but the closer they are into the star, the more, the more it helps because you get more cycles. Kind of a random question, but would the composition of the planet change? Like, the fact that Jupiter is a gas planet and we're a rocky planet, would that change the, the fact that it's so much bigger but it's made of different materials? Not much. No. Not, not for these measurements, but bizarrely for gas giants. Well, and, and other planets, too. If you have, imagine you've got, like, um, Neptune, say going in front of the sun. <laughs> Neptune's not this big. <laughs> but it's got a fuzzy little atmosphere. Then you can measure the starlight coming through the atmosphere and see like methane lines in the atmosphere. It's a very weak signal. You can't do it with the Kepler spacecraft, but you can do it with other telescopes. So people have actually seen transmission lines through planetary atmospheres in front of their stars. And so this allows you to make some constraints on what the atmosphere is made out of. But that's that's hard to do, and it only works for big, thick atmospheres. I think. Do, do you? Does any? Do you know if we were looking at the Earth, going around the star, would we be able to be get any of our atmospheric lines in the data? No, not unless we were. I mean, it, not with our telescopes. Yeah, exactly yeah. Okay. So we've measured hydrogen escaping from a evaporating planet. People have claimed using. And the other thing that they wanted to find with the Kepler mission was not just find Earth-sized planets, but planets in the habitable zone. Yeah, does anybody know what that means? Somebody else. Exactly. So somewhere between Venus's distance and uh, Mars's distance. Somewhere around Earth. Yep. So that's what it was designed to do, and um, gosh, I guess it has found sort of one or two, hasn't it? Oh, it's found a lot, yeah. But it hasn't confirmed them. It's only a candidate. So that's right. They're only candidates. So Our where I was going with the parts per million thing was yeah. the one that, that Mike kind of drew up here with the 600 parts per million, which is 0.06% of a change in the light. Yeah. So that's this, that's this one right here, the biggest one, which is basically twice the radius of Earth. Oh, good Lord. And then this is the, the second biggest one, which is now smaller than Earth. And now the, the very smallest one is sort of the big headline one, which is smaller than Mercury. And so this is what the data actually looks like from Kepler. OK, great. Uh, so this is 600 parts per million. This is just noise from the star. And the noise, from, luckily, is only of order of like 50 parts per million. Was, they, was that the, pro the data reduction process they did in <coughs> ABC? Um, this is just folded on the different orbital periods. So the signal happens every very regularly. These are different planets, right? Yes, yeah, so these are three, oh, different, okay. three so different planets. Small, medium, large. Yeah. And so you can see the small is really, really buried in yeah. the But if you, since they have so many transits, because the orbital period, uh, I don't remember, it says it somewhere in here, the, uh, the orbital period is 13.4 okay. days. So they've got hundreds of days. They, they must have dozens and almost a hundred transits. So when you fold all those on, you see those little blue points. Those are like bend points, and you can definitely see that there are those those points right here lie below the sort of the mean. So the red is their little model. Uh, so anyway, that's that's really cool. So you can get an estimate of the radius of the planet if you know the radius of the host star, but that's really hard to model. I mean, we only know that sort of stuff. It's 20% accuracy if you just know the type of star it is. And it turns out that this star actually pulsates. And so they were able to get the radius of the host star to uh, something like 2% from the, uh, the stellar pulsation, which is what you were sort of looking at with the lab this week. And so that was able to constrain the radius of the planets to better than uh, uh, the right. Yeah. Well, it looks uh, like one part in a thousand, if yeah, you believe it. Doesn't, it doesn't have the. <laughs> Does point, it says plus or minus 0.026. Oh, that's for the star. Oh, for the yeah, oh, okay. yeah, planet. Yeah. So yeah, so that's of order 2%. But then you can extrapolate that into the radius of the planet. Mm -hmm. which oh, there they are. Here they are. So they're also getting really That's good, pretty good. Accuracy. So that's really, really cool. They don't say who did the seismological analysis, do they? They do. Uh, I'm wondering if it's Travis or not. Uh, Travis did, yeah. So, so Travis helped. There was. Uh, I think it was mostly uh, bedding. Uh, okay. Because it was stellar like oscillator, you know, solar type. Uh, 
Travis does that too. Let's see, who all in the office? So here's Fergal. He graduated from our group about five years ago. Good God, everybody's on this. Um, uh, you know, a lot of people start Bill Cochran, about. he's upstairs. <laughs> so they tried to do radial velocity, that's why he's on there, but the radial velocity is the upper limit on this. Yeah, I can believe it. Steve Powell wrote that little handout I gave you about the oh, here's Travis. CCD reduction. So he graduated from our group too. So see, you can, you can be one of a cast of thousands. Yeah. If you, but that's what happens with space missions because they require such resources and there's only one of them. Yeah. <laughs> Are you guys trying to get a computer virus or something? <laughs> New awards. I, you'll just have to read that in your spare time. <laughs> so one of the things. Do you guys ever read that bad astronomy blog? Yeah. Uh, it's good. It's a good blog. Yeah. And they part of the write up on this, or part of his write up. Uh, gave shout out to Travis because a lot of the besides <coughs> all for Kepler, which is where you're using the pulsations to learn about the stars, uh, that got NASA stopped funding that. Yeah. So basically, it's, that's how Travis met Kepler. And Travis started up a nonprofit where you can adopt a star. That's right. You pay ten dollars and you adopt a star. And, and he'll uh, tell you all about it, like you know, as it goes to college, et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> no, as it gets analyzed, he tells you more about it. So. so Phil wrote up Well, good. Shoot. I should check that out. Do y'all have any more questions on that? And none of us really know. Now, the Kepler mission has been officially extended, right? For another three years? Okay. I heard also that before that happens, that since it's getting farther and farther away, the data transmission gets slower and slower. Because you can't send the data as fast because it comes in as a weaker signal, you know? And so you basically have to translate a little slower, or transmit a little slower. So it, it'll sort of gradually fade away. And eventually, yes, it'll go behind the sun. But it, it gets worse. It gets Yeah, it'll come back around the sun. And <laughs> and then maybe if we ever have any way of going to space again, <laughs> we could have a refurbishing mission. Yeah, it's weird. Most satellites orbit the Earth. This one doesn't. It trails the Earth and it orbits the Sun with the Earth. So, yeah, well, they they know how to make rockets, so that that's a good thing. Um, all right. Well, it, that was a good discussion. If you all have more questions, just let me know. I have only a tiny little presentation for you this week. Um, but I thought I would talk a little bit about what our Lyra stars are. That really didn't help. <laughs> Everything got dark except the screen. Yeah. Uh, no. Could you turn that off back there, Arena? Maybe that's where that goes. Yeah. It went off for a second. So this light does not go off. We did it. What'd you do? It just takes a second. Okay, so it takes a second. Does that mean I can turn this one back on? Okay. <laughs> All right. Yeah, so um, just wanted to, you know, what is what are these stars and what are they good for? Um, by the way, so we're all looking at the same star. Why the hell is this here? <laughs> okay. It's right there. Yep. Oh, good. Sorry about that. Oh. There we go. Um, so where are they again? Right here. Right here. So here's the classical instability strip where you got your Cepheids and the RR Lyra stars. And here's the temperature along here. And so you notice it's, it's not vertical, but it's fairly vertical. The temperature doesn't change very much, at least within this little um, box where the RR Lyra stars are. Oh, yeah, we, we discovered some new white dwarfs. I don't want to talk about that. 
Um, and so, yeah, um, let's see. So it, this is the, the class of stars is named after the prototype, which is the star RR Lyrae, which is basically the first variable star discovered in the constellation Lyra. Now there's very little about the nomenclature in astronomy that is logical. It's all pretty just sort of made up. <laughs> so the very first variable star in a constellation that gets discovered is called RR something, RR the constellation. And then, then how does it go? Is it SS or is it RS? Yeah, he did. He, he spent like half a lecture <laughs> telling us the nomenclature. And I was like, yeah, that's neat. I won't forget that. Um, but you think, you think it's, it's, it's like the Rth one, you know, in the constellation? No, no, it's the first one. Um, and so there's a lot of RRs out there, and it means the brightest variable star in the constellation. Um, here's a very schematic HR diagram that's kind of expanded and out a little bit. They are mostly metal poor population two stars. Any, so some of y'all have had an astronomy class, right? And do you remember what population two and one is? Oh, cool. Okay. It's, it's again, silly nomenclature. So, you know, the universe, well, the Big Bang happened, galaxies started forming, and then after that, stars formed. And so you had early stars and you had late stars. Guess what the name we give to the early stars is? Very good. <laughs> exactly, it's backwards. And so population star one stars are the stars that are forming now. The real, the real definition, I think, well, actually I don't know the real definition. The, the way I think of it is old stars that have very few metals in them. So basically just hydrogen and helium, not much else. Those are population two stars. And stars born later where they've, lots of supernovae have gone off, lots of mass loss from other stars has enriched the heavy element content of all the gas. And the ones that form out of that, like our sun, are population one stars. So probably it was that people looked at population one stars first, and then they found some of these other stars that looked different. They didn't have as many spectral lines, and they said, oh, those are different. We'll call them population two stars. That's probably what happened. But unlike other fields, we never go back and try to make sense of it. We just keep the uh, silly nomenclature. Um, so they're pulsating horizontal branch stars, which means that they've, they're not on the main sequence. They've, they may have started out here. They burned up all their hydrogen, became a red giant. Then they started burning helium. And maybe they've settled into this region here. So, And the most important thing about them is that they have something called a period luminosity relation. So from the data you guys took, about what period did this RR Lyra star have? Uh, no, the, the, the period. Days? <laughs> What's that? 0.5 days? Okay. Yeah, I, I thought it was more like about half, point, about half a day as a period. Okay, so I don't know where you're getting 26 from. Yeah, um, yeah, you just basically, I should have put up some of that data. <laughs> the axis along the bottom is days. And so if you count how many pulses in two days, you get something like four. It gives you the frequency, and then how do you convert that to a period? So that's not right. It should have been more like two. I mean, there will be spurious peaks in the Fourier transform, but the biggest one um, is right around two, two days, or sorry, two per days. And so one over that is about half a day. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and so anyway, about a half a day. It turns out that these stars do have periods of about a half a day. These other pulsating stars, the Cepheids, can have periods anywhere from like five days up to 40 days. So these are really slow. And these guys are, are comparatively uh, really fast. And they were um, 
discovered right around 1900 by a bunch of guys at um, Harvard, well, a bunch of people at Harvard, many of whom were women, actually. And um, I won't say all of the important discoveries were made by women, but it seems like most of them were. Um, so the, the discovery of the period luminosity relationship was actually made by someone named Henrietta Leavitt. Oh, and by the way, these people did calculations, and they called them computers. So a person was a computer because they computed. You know, sort of like a scribe. She was a computer, and they had like a whole team of computers um, doing this sort of stuff. It's really funny. Really funny uh, way of talking about people. So let's see. That won't let me do that. Let me try and pull up this web page. I just like the way this looks. So here's a, um, a sequence of images taken of a cluster. Let's see, I've forgotten which one it is. M3? Yeah, M3. M3, okay. Yeah, and so, you know, they're just different in time. And so you can see some stars change brightness and some stars don't. And the stars that you see changing brightness are the RR Lyra stars in the cluster. So there's, there's quite a few of them. You know, this one, this one. These two, these two. Yeah, yeah, I think so because the other, there's um, probably almost no Cepheid variables in there, and any of the other variables would be dimmer than this. So the ones that we're actually able to see and that there's lots of are our Lyra stars, typically. Um, and again, this is a globular cluster. You guys don't know this, but the globular clusters, or at least a lot of them, formed very early, so right as our galaxy was forming. So most of the stars in the globular cluster are old, metal-poor stars. And that's where we find these RR Lyrae stars. Um, so it makes sense that you'd find a lot in the globular cluster. And how close are the closest stars in these clusters? How, close, how far away is this cluster? No, how close are the closest stars in these clusters? I don't know. I don't know. It seems like a lot of gravity there. Yeah, but they're not just sitting there. Yeah, that's a good question. They are. Oh, yeah, well, this cluster is gravitationally bound. So what you've got, I can't remember. Does anybody remember how big across a globular cluster is? Parsecs? I really don't remember, but it's, it's non-trivial. It's, it's a fair, fair thing. And so you got something like a million stars. Somewhere between 100,000 and a million stars. Yeah, I, don't, I won't draw them all. And you're right, there's lots of them. Now, but remember, stars are really small, so they don't run into each other. So even though there's a whole bunch, they're like points, and so they don't, they don't run into each other, but they do interact gravitationally. So the net gravitational field keeps everything bound. So stars that try to escape, you know, eventually fall back into the central potential of the cluster. Um, well, it's, a, it's like a gas. It's, it's as if the stars are like gas particles. But for gas particles, the thing that contains a gas are the walls of the box you put the gas in, right? Here, it's the gravitational field of all the particles together. And so there aren't any walls. Gravity acts like the walls. It's kind of, it's definitely different, in fact. It's way different. Um, very, very, very interesting. And so, yeah, these stars here, if you looked, if you looked a billion years from now, these stars might well be on the other side of the cluster. And the farther down inside the cluster is, the faster is everything is moving. So the gravitational forces are strong down here, so the velocities are, are fast. The farther you get out here, the slower things are going. Um, and people have actually studied this, and you can actually make pretty good numerical models of globular clusters now. Um, there's few enough stars in them that you can actually simulate the position of every star and evolve it for billions of years. Um, that part's doable. It gets a lot harder, though, because stars 
aren't really point particles. And you know, after so long, they use up all their hydrogen, they become red giants. You know, and then they dump mass out. And so um, the fact that the stars evolve coupled to the fact that there's a million of them moving around is a fairly complicated problem. But we can model it pretty well. Well, all right. So, so if these are, say we live in a star, a blog or a cluster, how important that would be? Um, I think Isaac Asimov may have written a story about that. Yeah. It's probably worth reading, yeah. He did, but they were good. So what's the what's the proportional size? Like, would we be seeing stars everywhere around us, or are they? Yeah. Yeah. So, so Wikipedia says that the density is about four times higher. Than so. Oh, it's not that much denser. Not important. So I'm making the four up, but it's the typical distance between stars in a galaxy cluster is about a light year. Okay. And so the nearest star to our sun is maybe four or five light years. Okay, which means actually that the the density is that cubed. No. You know. But, but and that's sort of that's over the whole, lot of, but near the core. It's very dense. They're, they're separated by, by <coughs> hundreds of AU or less. Yeah, that's. Yeah, so very very entertaining stuff goes on. In fact, um, I was at the University of Cambridge, and there's a guy there named Sfera Arset, who did several interesting things. He, um, besides climbing mountains, he spent his entire career as a postdoc, and he he retired a few years ago. But he's one of the world leaders on in-body simulations of globular clusters. And there's lots of entertaining things that can happen. It's sort of like chemistry. Two stars can come in and interact. And due to tidal dissipation, they can go into orbit around each other. Or three stars can get together and manage to put two of them into an orbit around each other. And it turns out that if you form one binary, um, you know, Gravity is gravity pulls everything in toward the center. It pulls heavier things into the center first. So binary stars, if you think of them as a system, they're about twice as heavy as other stars. So binaries tend to sink to the center. So if you look in here, you find a much higher proportion of binaries than if you look out here. And another bizarre thing about globular clusters is if you think you've got a binary like this, if another star comes in and glances off the binary, you know, interacts, what generally happens is it kind of gets thrown out with greater energy. You know, you can think of it as if you've got a spinning disk here and you throw something at it, it bounces, you get greater energy. So the binary gets more tightly bound and it goes faster around and the star gets thrown out also faster. So you steal energy from the binary and it like heats up the center of the cluster. It makes the velocities of the stars hotter. It's really, really bizarre stuff. Eventually these stars will merge, yeah. Yes. It's similar to the emitting gravity waves. It's similar. It's not gravity waves here. You're directly stealing it out of the orbit. But yes, it's the same sort of thing. So anyway, they're entertaining groups. I didn't want to spend forever talking about globular clusters. But uh, they are really cool. And they are the oldest part of our galaxy. There are some globular clusters that are 12 giga years old. And the universe itself is only about 14 billion years old. So that's a big, big difference. All right, well here is a period luminosity relation that was published in about 1912 by these people at Harvard. I think it was Henrietta Leavitt and Pickering. I don't know his first name. Um, I don't know why there's two lines here. I'm sorry. I really don't. Let's just look at one of them. So this is log period going from zero. So log period, let's see. Log of one is zero, right? Okay, so this goes from one day here to 100 days here, because this is log of two. And this is magnitudes. And um, magnitudes, again, one of the dumbest units ever. It's, it's related to how bright something is, but it's the wrong way. So if something, is, if you have a 15th magnitude star and a 20th magnitude star, which one's brighter? 15th, yeah, it's like golf, lower is better, you know? And um, every five magnitudes is a factor of 100 in brightness. So the 15th magnitude star is 100 times brighter than the 20th magnitude star. That's really about all I know about magnitudes. So delta M equals five magnitudes implies 
100 times, either brighter or dimmer. Since it's linear, does that mean you can have negative? It's not linear, it's log, actually. Okay, um, but you can still have negative magnitudes? Yeah, sure. Like the sun has minus 26 magnitudes, the moon's like minus 10, Sirius is maybe minus 1. Jupiter is super bright. Isn't it like minus 3 or something? Venus is minus four, that's the champion, for things that aren't the sun or the moon. And then you start getting, and about the faintest you can see with your eye is magnitude six. The white dwarf stars we typically observe are magnitude 15 or 16. Um, and you know, galaxies are magnitude 20 and worse, uh, typically. So, yeah, it makes sense to use the logarithmic scale, but wouldn't it make sense to just take the log? But no. Uh, so the magnitude is like, it's like, God, what is it? It's like two-fifths of the log of how bright the star is, of the luminosity of the star. So a factor, I did that wrong, five halves, sorry, 2.5. So if you change this by a factor of 100, the log of 100 is 2 and 2 times 2.5 is 5. So this is what we use. Now the reason we use that is because the Greeks or the Romans came up with a scheme where they said that looks like a magnitude 1 star and that looks like a magnitude 3 star. And so it was just kind of the way it looked to our eyes. And our eyes are logarithmic. So it came out as a logarithmic scale, but the absolute how big a magnitude is was just defined kind of arbitrarily. And so in an attempt to make it make sense, we did this. <laughs> I find that the, the hardest part about this is simply that brighter means lower magnitude. So when somebody says to you, yeah, this star has a greater magnitude, I have no idea what they mean. I don't know if it means it's a higher magnitude, so it's fainter, or it's brighter. So I always say brighter magnitude or dimmer magnitude, because then you can work out which way it has to go. Yeah, it's, it's a real shame. All right, so anyway, there's a period luminosity relationship. So this is how bright the star is, and so higher magnitudes are down here because this is fainter. The fainter the star is, the, um, the shorter its period is, and the longer its period is, the, uh, the brighter the star is. So the good news about that is you, you don't have to know how far away the star is. You can measure the period, whether the star is dim or bright, and then you can use this to work out how bright it really is. You can compare how bright it really is to how bright it looks, and that gets you the distance. Because if it's real bright but it looks dim, that means it's far away. And you can, you can work that out. And so what they did is they had to have some nearby stars where they independently knew how far away they were, and they could calibrate this and check it. So they could really say, oh yeah, the longer period ones are brighter. And then, you know, you could use it for stars that are so far away that you, um, you, can't, you can't use other techniques to find out how far away they are. Okay. I guess I could go back to presentation mode. So can we understand these periods and the period luminosity relation? Well, in a very qualitative way, yeah. First of all, Let's do an estimate of if you have a star and it pulsates, what would be the period that you would guess it would have? And I'm, I'm, I'm going to cheat a little. I'm going to say, OK, well, that period should be equal to what something I call the dynamical time scale or the orbit time scale or whatever. Um, so if here's my star, and it has mass m and radius r, I can imagine, imagine putting a particle in an orbit around it, right? Just above the surface. How many of y'all have had or are having physics 301? OK. What's the acceleration of something in a circular orbit? V squared over r. OK, so acceleration is v squared over r. And what is the acceleration of gravity at the surface of the star in terms of m and r? Mm -hmm. 
Hang on. Somebody uh, else? Oh, um. You got the m over r squared part, right? But there's a, there's a gravitational constant. OK. Well, that's cool. So let's do, if we set these two guys equal to each other, we get that, right? All right, so we can, if I cross out the r's, I find that v squared, or v, is the square root of gm over r. Now, when it's going around, how far around does it have to go to get back to here? Okay, and what's the formula for the circumference? Okay, 2 pi r, and we divide by the velocity, right? Because we want to get how long it takes. So if you do that, you get 2 pi r cubed over gm. OK. And if I wanted to write m in terms of the mean density of the sun, how would I do that? If I got volume and density and mass, how are they related? Yeah, OK, density is mass per volume. OK. OK, so the mean mass, I mean, mean density is mass times volume. So I'm going to rewrite m as volume times the mean density. And what's the volume of the sphere? OK. Yeah, so the r's cancel. So you got 2 pi. 1 over, well, actually, g rho, and a whole bunch of constants, um, which I'm going to kind of ignore for now, because we're running out of time. But it goes like g rho average to the minus 1 half. OK? Well, it turns out that this is very similar to what's called the dynamical time scale. Imagine all the mass in the sun was concentrated at its center. And imagine you dropped a rock at its present surface and let it fall in. How long would that take? Then I'm not going to do the integral. There is an integral you can do, which, by the way, I stumped Mathematica with it. <laughs> Couldn't believe that today until I did like the first half of it for it. And then it was able to get there. Um, but you know how this is not right. But it's order of magnitude. If I imagine the gravitational acceleration is constant from here to here, it's not really. But if I imagine it was, then 1 half gt squared would need to equal r. And so the time to fall would be r, 2r over g, to the 1 half. And it turns out that if you substitute everything in, this was basically r over g. And so you're going to get again. This goes like g rho to the minus 1 half. OK? All right, so this is, this is generally true. So the pulsation period, uh, period of the pulsation for a star that's really doing its lowest order radial mode is going to go like this. So if you get a really dense star like a white dwarf, then this is going to be 10 seconds. You get a star like the sun, it's going to be a few hours. You get a star like. Um, a Cepheid star, which is really big, you're going to get days. Uh, but they all follow this relation. OK, well, yeah, sorry, yeah. Um, please turn in the lab notebooks. And maybe I'll finish this up next time, because we're just out of time. Yeah, so turn in the lab notebooks. And if you haven't turned in the lab, turn those in, too. Because I'm not sure how many of those we've gotten. I have a question. Yeah. Um, yes. This thingy, um, <clears throat>